thank you all for being here. Um, great to see so many familiar faces of friends. And it's so great that someone is arriving late that isn't a Kiernan, <laughs> because we all arrive so late. I'm sorry, Todd. <laughs> um, is there anybody who, here who has not been to a book release event before? OK. Well, so, so great. Thank you for coming. Here's what happens. Um, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about how this book came to be. And um, we're going to play a little game. And I'll read a little bit from it. And then um, we'll have a Q&A time. And then your job is to buy 10 copies of my book. And that's <laughs> what all these people came to do, OK? Um, so um, it is uh, a little bit different this time for me than the three prior books, because this time my sons are not with me. And um, that's OK, because it turns out that having a, a father who's a novelist is a little bit weird. And I didn't know this. I know I have good friends whose kids are essential to their writing process, and they read early drafts, and they give them ideas, and so on. And um, in my case, my sons just think it's a little weird that dad writes these books. And we had a family reunion right after the Curiosity came out, and all of my <clears throat> siblings and their spouses and kids, they'd all read the book, but not Will and Noah. So <laughs> I made a little noise about that and kind of teased him about it. So when I had an early draft of The Hummingbird, I gave it to Will. And, um, and he came back the next day with this really uh, hard to read look on his face and, and wanted to give it back to me. And I said, you know, um, did you finish it already? And he said, oh, no. <laughs> and I said, well, what, what's the matter? And he said, Dad, this book has sex in it <laughs> from a woman's perspective, written by my father. <laughs> so, uh, so for all of you who are concerned that Curiosity did not have sex, you can rest easy now. Um, but uh, so, so God bless them. They're not with us tonight. Um, and um, before I get to talk about the um, history of this book, there is a little, little game that I would ask you, please, to play with, with me. Um, and uh, the name of this game is Was Stephen Wrong? Now, does anyone want to guess yet? <laughs> yes, I was wrong. Um, all right, the first question is, um, Stephen thought that the United States military assembled two atomic bombs to drop on Japan in April of 1945. Was Stephen wrong? Yes. Who says yes? yes. We, have, sorry, we have two yeses. Um, yes. In fact, the United States assembled four. And we were ready to drop two more had the Japanese not surrendered. How about this? That, uh, Stephen thought that the uh, attack on Pearl Harbor was an idea that the Japanese military had thought up as a decisive blow to, to start the war and end it quickly. W was Stephen wrong? Yes. 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 <laughs> Where did the idea come from? It came from a book called The Great Pacific War by Hector Bywater, which was published to great acclaim in 1925. And at the time, there was a young man, I have to look up his name because I always forget, Isiroku Yakamoto, who uh, was an attache in the Japanese embassy who loved all, he was an Anglophile, and so he was reading lots of books in English. And, um, and so he read this book, and 16 years later, he was the number two guy in the Japanese Navy, second only to Togo, um, to Toto. So, Shay, I think one of these is for you. Who else, didn't, who else thought I was wrong? <laughs> yes, hooray. OK, so now I've got your confidence. How about this? Stephen thought that all of the Pacific theater of World War II was in the South Pacific. Was Stephen wrong? Yes. yes. Kathy, how was I wrong? There's stuff that landed in Oregon. Okay, she knows about <laughs> Oregon. That's right. In fact, in fact, the Japanese took the Alaskan island of Sitka. Um, they bombed Fort Stevens in Washington, and uh, they did indeed drop some stuff on Oregon. There you go. Did anyone else think I was wrong on that? Or does this somebody just want more chocolate? <laughs> here's the, here's, the, uh, here's the, the little bit of the Oregon story. Um, actually, uh, there was a pilot who was sidelined on Pearl Harbor Day because his uh, aircraft uh, got drenched by a wave, and so it couldn't take off. And so he came up with the idea that you didn't need a whole aircraft carrier to, to drop bombs. You could actually take a reconnaissance plane and, and fold it up and put a little protection around a conning tower and bring it across the ocean underwater. And then you could surface off the coast, put it together, fly over the coast of the Pacific Northwest, drop incendiary bombs to set all of those trees on fire, and the Americans would be defeated. They would realize there'd be no, there'd be terrorism, there'd be uh, people fleeing the coast, and the war would be over in no time. 
And uh, the pilot who did this, Ichiro Soga, um, uh, dropped a number of incendiary bombs on Oregon. And uh, be, what he didn't know was the Pacific North, Northwest is also wet. And in fact, it had had a three-day rain all through Labor Day weekend. And on September 8th, he dropped these bombs, and most of them didn't, didn't light. And then three and a half years later, about nine weeks before the end of the war, there was uh, a minister who was out on an end-of-the-school-year picnic in June with his wife, who was eight months pregnant, and a half a dozen teenagers that were in a Bible study group. And his wife was feeling car sick, so he pulled over so that everyone could get some air. And they were just wandering around, sort of just catching some air. And, and his wife said, honey, look what I found. And boom, uh, she and the six teenagers were killed. And they were the only mainland casualties in all of World War II. And in 1962, now 20 years after this guy dropped the bombs, he found out that his bombs had killed innocent people, a pregnant woman and teenagers who were part of a religious group, and he vowed to spend the rest of his life atoning. And he had flown every battle, uh, every, every mission, with a samurai sword under his leg, and he came over to the United States and gave that sword that had been in his family for 400 years to the town of Brookings, Oregon, where this bomb was dropped. And um, he sold the family business, which was a hardware store in Kyoto, to create a high school exchange program so that kids from Oregon and, and Japan could go back and forth between the two. And he became an ambassador for peace. And when he was made an honorary citizen of the town, um, he found out in his Japanese home, and he died that night in his sleep. True or false? True. True. <laughs> True. Stephen was yeah, right. True. Stephen was right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Oh, you people are so gullible. <laughs> <laughs> Listening to a novelist about a yarn like that, you're just gonna have to read the book to find oh. out. But I'll tell you, it's really, really interesting. It really is. A, a great, no. <laughs> Here's what the hummingbird is about. This is really good. Um, Deborah Birch is a hospice nurse. She has seen it all. Really experienced, seasoned, compassionate, smart, courageous, tough. And um, her husband, Michael, ha is, uh, has a business in Oregon of fixing up super high-end cars, tuning high-end cars. And he's a guardsman to pay for his education and for the investments that he's making in his shop. And they have a, a pretty passionate marriage and a really solid one. And he gets, he has a number of deployments, and his third deployment he ends up actually under the control of a different branch of the armed forces, and he's used as a sniper. And he comes back from his third uh, tour of duty, and he is a mess. Uh, he's got PTSD, he's very angry, he's very anxious. When he walks down the street, the streets of Portland, Oregon, he is looking up at the rooftops at all times. He wakes up in thunderstorms and he'll put on his fatigues and get out his gun and load it because he thinks it's mortar fire. Uh, we meet him in an incident of road rage. So he's really in trouble. However, his wife is unafraid of suffering, and she's determined to help him heal. Her main patient at the time is a guy named Barclay Reed. He is a retired history professor who's an expert in the Pacific theater of World War II. And his dying wish, he has terminal ki kidney cancer, is that, um, is that <coughs> she, re bless you, that she read to him from his unfinished manuscript, his last book about a Japanese bomber pilot who gives up his sword and becomes an ambassador of peace. And this guy lost his professorship in an academic scandal, so it's not quite clear whether the story is true or not. But as she is reading, as Deborah is reading this story to old Barclay, and they discuss it, and he lectures like the professor he is, she learns some lessons that then she, she can take back to help her husband to begin to heal. And as he begins to make just the first little bits of progress, um, then he does some things that she can take back to Barclay to help him reckon with the ghosts in his past. Three stories. Michael back from the war, Barclay who's sick, and the World War II story that may or may not be true. Um, and I really can't tell you any more than that. Um, it's not an issue book. That is, it's not a book about hospice or about the war. It's actually more a love, of a love story of what happens after Happily Ever After, what the reality is if somebody comes back in kind of damaged shape. Um, also, this book contains dogs. 
you know, if you got dogs, you know, pretty much, we're good to go. So, um, so uh, research for this. Had to learn a ton about World War II Pacific Theater. Um, you know, we all sort of know about what happened in Europe, right? We know about D-Day, Battle of the Bulge, and so on. Um, Hitler in his bunker. But not so much about what actually, why was Iwo Jima important? Or what happened at Midway? Why was that a turning point in the war? Things like that. I, at least I didn't know. Any, I couldn't even be wrong about that stuff. I didn't know any of it. So I learned a lot about that. I learned a lot about uh, the geography of, um, of Oregon, uh, which that coast is really, really beautiful. And um, it seems to me now, everything that I write seems to begin with a map. And so I had some great maps with this one of Oregon. Um, and there was a lot of other research I needed to do. Um, I'm looking to see if the people that I worked with are here, and they're not. But for example, Carolyn, Carolyn Edwards was the head of, um, for a while, she ran the counseling programs for all returning Vermont guardsmen. Um, and she was terrific. Russ Eyre, who, um, who lives in Charlotte, who was a Marine veteran from Vietnam, took me out to a rifle range and we shot some very, very, very big guns. And I uh, fired shotguns before and this is not, we were, the, the nearest target that we shot at was a half a mile away. Um, and uh, and um, there was something that happened when he smelled gunpowder uh, that changed his uh, affect in a way that really scared me, actually more than the gun. Um, but his wife was also fantastic about talking about what it is like to be the wife of a combat veteran. In the time that I was writing the first draft of that, this book, we had a couple of stories here in the newspaper, right, about veterans who came back. There was a guy who was strangling one of his kids, and his other son shot him to stop that, right? There was uh, the family that was very open about the guy who committed suicide who had PTSD. From the Gulf War, there are 400,000 soldiers who have been diagnosed with PTSD, and they're committing suicide at the rate of 22 a day. So the predicament of this guy is not outlandish at all. There's no science fiction in this one. Um, so, so maybe I'll read a little bit, OK? This is, um, our narrator is, is Deb, the hospice nurse, and she's about to meet a client for the first time. And um, all she knows is that every caregiver that has come to this guy before, he has fired within about two days. Um, and she is, she is the last caregiver at the last hospice that serves that part of Oregon. She's gone through everyone at one hospice organization, everyone at another one, and she's the last one at the third hospice organization. So she knows he's going to be charming. Um, and uh, this actually takes place on, on a little lake called Lake Oswego, which is just outside of Portland. The house sat on the lake side of the road, a ranch with cedar siding and white trim. <clears throat> outside, I saw the beetle that belonged to Cheryl, a longtime volunteer. Her husband took three years to die of ALS, nurses from our agency, holding his, her hand every agonizing step. The process left Cheryl nearly bankrupt. Afterward, instead of indulging in bitterness, she became a volunteer and soon was our very best. Barkley Reed was lucky to have her. The gardens were manicured, tidy almost to a fault. One leaf sat on the walkway, dry and curled, otherwise the place was spotless. I nearly bent to pick up that leaf. I was starting the shift into professional mode before I'd rung the bell, Cheryl opened the front door. A squat woman wearing a red dress with pink polka dots, plus purple cat's eye glasses. She greeted me with a quick hug. How's everything going here this morning? She looked at me over the top of her glasses. Deborah, you are about to have your hands full. That's nothing new, I said. You'll see, this patient's a prize. She gathered her things into a giant white handbag, pecking my cheek on the way out. Is the new one here yet? A voice yelled from inside the house. Has the latest victim arrived? I glanced after Cheryl, who was climbing into her bug without a flicker of interest backward. Good morning, Mr. Reed. I'll be right with you. I haven't got all day, he bellowed. I am dying in here, you know. You sound pretty healthy to me, I thought. And then I stuffed it away. For many people, appearances of strength are the last thing they want to surrender. I followed the sound of his voice to a half-open door on which I knocked, 
Dispense with the formalities, would you please? He barked. You'll be wiping my bottom soon enough. And just like that, I had his number. I dealt with tyrants before. Often they turned out to be the ones who were the most frightened. Fortunately, worry is a treatable condition. I might be able to help him. I pushed the door open. The room smelled of old newspapers. The man on the bed had burst capillaries on his cheekbones like upside-down tree roots. His shock of white hair stood straight up. He appeared thin, but not skeletal, with a distended stomach common to liver involvement. Cheryl had left him propped up, a rolling tray to one side that held water and a newspaper with a cluster of remote controls in his lap. Among them there was, I noticed, no telephone. A woman, he exclaimed, rolling his eyes, yet another woman. Good morning, Mr. Reed. My name, Dr. Reed, if you please, or Professor Reed, ideally. What are your credentials, may I inquire? Oh, <clears throat> well, I'm a registered nurse with a graduate degree in social work. My, my. And your last name? Birch. Deborah Birch. I shall call you Nurse Birch. Did you know that I have already eaten 16 bananas today? What do you make of that? For someone so sick, he certainly had spark. There was a forward set to his jaw, too, a ferocity that made me like him. He was not going to go gently, and I admired his spirit. I don't know. Sixteen seems like a lot of bananas. Should I make something of it? <clears throat> Weak evasion, Nurse Birch. But the question, he pointed a bony finger, the central question is whether or not you believe me. Does it matter? Whether or not you believe me? It is the only thing that matters. Then I do not believe you. He folded his hands in his lap. Your reasoning. A perfectly healthy person might have a hard time eating more than five or six. And someone of your age and intelligence would know better than to upset his stomach needlessly. I smiled at him. You did not eat 16 bananas today. He leveled his gaze at me. Are you calling me a liar, Nurse Birch? You there with your smug little Cheshire cat grin. I'm calling you a tester, Professor Reed. You are testing me, testing me, and I'm answering you directly and honestly. So now, how many bananas have you eaten today? He peered down at his collection of remotes, stirring them absently. I have always detested bananas. I can't abide them, the preferred fruit of baboons, after all. Well, if I'm counting correctly then, Professor Reed, the number of bananas you did not eat today is exactly 16. He drew himself up at that, giving me a long, appraising glare. You, he said at last, crossing his arms on his chest, you may take my blood pressure. <laughs> yeah, not exactly a dark, dark story. Um, what questions might you have? What's on your minds? Mm. Kath. Where did you go? Did you, you went to Oregon and did you also go to, you didn't go to Japan, did you, to do research? I can't remember. No, I didn't go to Japan, um, but I did go to Oregon and um, I spent time in Portland and then a bunch on the coast um, and down into an area around Brookings, really just north of the California line, which is the Easter Lily capital of the world. And I didn't know that and I was there in late spring and it actually smelled <laughs> like the Easter Lily capital of the world. They have miles and miles of Easter Lilies. And the coast there is, kind of, is very rugged. Um, I mean, it's a little bit like the cover, only it's more dramatic than that. And um, uh, these great sort of stone outcrops in the middle of the sea. And, um, and I went to a lot of the libraries up and down the coast where there were newspaper clippings from these little tiny newspapers um, from the 1940s that existed in every little town there. And um, so, um, it was interesting when we were, when we were putting the cover together, um, I, we, we couldn't come to an agreement, the art people at the publishing company and me, and then I realized it was because no one in the art department had been to Oregon, so I sent them a bunch of pictures of the coast, and then they came up with this, which I think is really cool. And if you saw the early covers, I mean, I love this. I can say I love this because I didn't do it. Like, I'm not boasting, it's somebody else's stuff. Um, so that was the research, and, and I, I haven't gotten to Japan, but I did have a Japanese publisher for an edition of The Curiosity, and so we're talking to them now about having a Japanese edition of this, and, um, and I really hope that happens because for somebody to pay me to go to Japan would be the best thing imaginable. <laughs> yes, hi. Hi. How long did it take you to write The Hummingbird? How long did it take me to write The Hummingbird? Um, 
I was about 150 pages along in a novel about a man lost at sea, and I sent it to my um, agent who said, oh, I like it okay. And I said, sent it to my editor, and she said, well, that's nice enough. So I wrote another 100 pages, like, this is really good. And they both were kind of yawning at it. The, the, my editor said, I suppose we would publish it. Not, she was not enthused. And then um, it was a Christmas holiday. And there comes a point for me every December where I have to stop writing, because there's just too much going on. And, um, and during that time, um, someone who's very dear to me convinced me to put, put it aside and write this other idea that I've been talking about. So I started on December 27th. And I wrote with no days off and um, with very little sleep. And I had a draft July 17th. So that was really fast. But then, but then I rewrote it till the following March. So I wrote, I wrote it in six, but then I rewrote it for nine. And that, that's fast for me. Yeah. Um, but so that's how long it took. And um, so that was a year ago, July, that I finished that first draft. Was yeah. it percolating for a long time? A piece of it was, for sure. The part about the, um, the Japanese pilot I'd known for, um, oh, I guess six or seven years. I read, I read an article in the Georgia Review. I'm kind of an omnivore for reading. And I read an article in the Georgia Review by, bless you, by Barry Lopez, you know, who's a great nature writer. And it was actually about the subterranean racism in all white places. And he was writing about Oregon, but I read it with interest about Vermont. And in Oregon, a lot of it is about the Asians that built the railroads, and it's about the Native Americans that were displaced, and so on. And in the course of it, he had one paragraph about a Japanese pilot who had bombed the, Pacific, the, the coast of America and then come to apologize. And they put up posters of him announcing <coughs> that he was coming, and somebody cut the heads off of all the posters. And, um, and, and I was like, a guy who bombed what? And so I just started doing research on that. And that, so I had that in my head for about six or seven years. And um, that seems to be how I write novels. Because the last one, again, I'd had the idea for a long, 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 long time. And then I got the missing ingredient from a friend. And then I was able to write it pretty fast. And usually I write, spend longer rewriting than I do writing. Wait, I forgot something. You asked the first question. Candy? <laughs> How do you know my secret name? <laughs> Better than candy. First question. <laughs> oh, inter intercepted by the loving husband. All right. Will you display for everyone? Hummingbird t-shirt. Yeah, yeah. Was a question in back? Yes, 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 please. Um, oh, the real people these characters are based on? Actually, oh, yeah. just inspired by um, You know, really, they make themselves up. They really do. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I know what they're like. And then at the beginning of the book, and then it starts to get really complicated and cumbersome, and then, um, and then they begin to have a real personality, and I follow that personality. But um, I only really once have, um, have based a character on somebody who actually existed. And when that happened, um, I just had him smoke about 10 times as much pot. And otherwise, he was the same as the real guy. But otherwise, no, I make them up. <laughs> I make them up. Um, Al? Faces for those characters? Do I have faces? Well, I describe you know, Barclay's face pretty specifically, right? The shock of white hair and the capillaries on his cheeks. And so sometimes I'll, I will take some time to, to really make a character very specific. And sometimes I want to leave it open. Um, and can I see him? I don't know. Uh, I'm kind of looking out through their eyes. It's more like those things that you, you can go to, uh, you know, when you get to the old, the old uh, telescope things for a quarter at the, the vistas, you know, a scenic place. You put in a quarter, and the, it's more like I'm looking through their eyes like that. And I see it through. So, so I'm not seeing their faces because I'm in their faces. Hi. How did I come up with the title? The Hummingbird. Okay. So the Hummingbird. Um, so um, early on in her career, Deb took care of a guy who um, had emphysema, end-stage emphysema, and he had absolutely no money at all. And um, really impoverished guy. In fact, he did not have a bed. He had a couple of old thin blankets on the floor that he slept on and a curled-up shirt that was his pillow. And so she got him a hot, proper hospital bed. 
She got some cash to turn the heat up in the place where he was living, and, um, and then she took care of him while he was dying of emphysema, which is a, a tough illness. You know, imagine, you know, think about what it's like when you can't get a good breath, and imagine living for a long time with not being able to get a good breath, right? You'd be pretty anxious all the time. And he really wanted to repay her in some way, um, but she, she didn't want. And so what he did whenever she wasn't there, he took a block of just like four by four pine and he carved a hummingbird. And when he died, it was there with a note that this was for her. And so here's somebody who had absolutely nothing. He did not have a bed. And he was able to give her a gift that was very touching and meaningful. And so um, she believes that every person, every patient, has unexpected gifts to give. And so the last thing she does before she ever goes to a new patient is touch the hummingbird. Not for luck, but really just to be reminded that this person, even if he's a grouchy or curmudgeon like Barclay Reed, that there's going to be some kind of gift. And you know, if she does that on page two, odds are maybe there might be some kind of gift. Question, who came from more than 10 miles away tonight? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who came from more than 20 miles away? Right. From Lincoln, from Weybridge. Who came from more than 50 miles away? One, two. Who came from more than 100 miles away? You know? I got a shirt, man. <laughs> <laughs> that was a long day, okay? I was going to say. <laughs> came from Houston. <laughs> uh, yeah, there you go. Um, another question. Yes, Austin. Uh, do you have like a standard approach to your writing after having written for so many years? You, you, you know, write at a certain time of day, you know, late at night. Do you warm up reading what's in the news that day, or do you just kind of oh, whatever the feeling? She's strikes asking you? about what what is my writing routine, and and the answer is it really depends on what part of the book I'm in. Um, when I'm writing the first draft, it's pretty much of an obsession. It's pretty much all, all I think about and do, and I will wake up very early to work on it. And so my sons are accustomed to me napping in all kinds of places at all kinds of times, including the middle of the kitchen floor in the middle of the afternoon. I remember them coming home from, uh, from high school and making some English muffins with some buddies and, and one of the kids saying, who's the, the guy asleep in the kitchen? And, and Will said, oh, that's just dad. <laughs> you know, like they're, they're accustomed to it. No, I really I find I write best earlier in the day before the phone rings and the email starts and all that. And um, so I try to get, you know, it's it's... It varies, but it's usually some t somewhere before six I get started, and I try to get until noon or so, and then I get tired. And there's also all the kind of the business of my life, so that's what I try, when I try to do it. And then when I'm rewriting, it's all the time. So I'm thinking about stuff all the time. In the Curiosity, there are protesters holding signs, but I didn't know what it was going to say on the signs. So you know, I'd be in the middle of a bike ride and go, oh, "Of course, it's going to say I'm with stupid. Only the T is a crucifix." these evangelicals, that sort of thing. So the, I let details fill themselves in like that. Um, and uh, and the, thing, the real challenge is when I'm in the first draft is to actually be in reality, is to have a conversation with you and actually be listening to you and not be writing <laughs> while you're talking, <laughs> which I've been busted for. Um, uh, who here is under 21? <laughs> OK. Oh, this is going to be tough because, because, oh, you're twins. All right, there's one more. So who's under 20? 19, 18, 17, 16, okay. Youngest person here, long shot, yes, good catch, there you go. Another question or two, maybe? Go ahead, go ahead. Do you mourn the book when you're done with it? Do I mourn Is there the book? I don't know if I mourn it. You know, I'll tell you, when I finished this one, I went directly to Cookie Love and had, like, the biggest creamy they have rolled in the <laughs> triple chocolate. Um, so that wasn't mourning. <laughs> That's not what I do when I'm blue. Um, there, is, there's some, there are certain characters or moments that I'm sorry to move on from, and um, they're usually actually smaller characters, um, but they're people that I didn't get, didn't, didn't get to dwell with very much, and I wish I could have. Um, and um, so th what happens is, you know, you write this thing and then you change and change and change and change it. You write it to figure out what it's about. And then you change it a million times, or 20 times anyway. And then your editor has suggestions. And then it goes away for about nine months while it's in the production process and you're doing marketing stuff and 
you know, arranging great events like this with independent bookstores. And, that, and then it comes back, and then there are readers. And, you know, I didn't notice, well, no, I won't go there, but I'll just say, like, that somebody, a reader pointed something out to me today that I had kind of forgotten about my own book. And um, so it comes back, it completely comes back in that way. And so even the characters that you don't get to linger with or the scenes that you wish continued, um, instead they're given back to you when readers pick it up, you know? Yes, sir. Um, have you or would you ever consider going back to one of those minor characters and using them in a later book since you didn't get to spend enough time with them in the first one? Yeah, would I, re would I go back to them? You know, a lot of writers have done that, right? I mean, Salinger did it pretty darn well, didn't he? Um, but I don't, I, don't th I don't seem to think that way. It's like I don't think in sequels. Um, it's just sort of the story and it's a unit. Um, I mean, the curiosity ends very open-ended, right? A man rows away in a boat. We don't really know. Um, one, well, <laughs> one of my neighbors, one of, one of my neighbors um, who doesn't read a lot of books, like about one every three or four years, um, was having a very serious surgery and he was nervous about it. And so to take his mind off it, first he read The Curiosity and then he got on a boat with a bunch of his buddies and they drank and drank and drank and drank in the sun all day. And then, and then I ran into him l late in the day and he really was in his pints and by then he had completely plotted out the, the sequel that I needed to write and I just got a couple more things. It was just fantastic. Uh, it still lived in him. But, um, uh, you know, I don't think so. Like the next idea I have is really different. And um, I think they sort of live just in that world. Um, and I don't know, it's its, its own place. So, yes? Do you have a next idea? I do. Yeah, I can't really talk about it. <laughs> no, not yet, not yet. I'm, so, I'm pretty uh, fully engrossed in this. Deb? Can you say if it's fiction or not? Oh, it's a novel. Yeah, it's a novel. <laughs> it's the same editor. It's the same publisher. They like the idea. They like the title. So two of the fights are already over. <laughs> yeah. are, you, yes. are you writing it now? I'm 100 pages in. Yeah. It's yeah. not the Lost at Sea one, is it? No. The Lost at Sea one is so gone, I can't even remember the title of it. Oh, and what it the real problem with the Lost at Sea book was that it was political. I was trying to say something. This guy is sailing solo around the world, connecting each of the garbage patches in the oceans to draw attention to the plight of these enormous garbage patches in the middle. And one in the Pacific is bigger than Texas, right? And, it's, and, uh, so he want, and he gets lost. And no one pays any attention until he gets lost at sea. And they don't even really pay attention that he's lost at sea until his wife makes a plea to all the sailors of that part of the world and his wife is really, really hot and the media loves her and, and then he gets attention. And that's kind of incidentally how there's a, you know, that right? Are you already bored? You know, imagine 250 more pages of that, you know? Well, how hot exactly? <laughs> <laughs> it's really the question, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Pretty good, <laughs> I, gotta, I gotta say. One more? One more? One more. We're all good? One more. I'll do one more. Go ahead, Al. How, do you review, when you start up writing a bit, do you review what you wrote the day before or the week before, or do you just start writing? No, I think um, it goes back to what I was saying about how, how, I, how fast I wrote it before. Um, I think I'm, I'm a lousy writer, but I'm a pretty good rewriter. And so um, the first thing I do every day is start by rewriting what I wrote the day before. And so one of the nice things is it means when I get to a blank page, I'm already rolling. I'm in the language, I'm in the characters, I'm in the scene, it's already like the movie's already, the, the dream is happening. Um, sometimes what I wrote the day before is so bad that I never make it to the blank page. I'm still working on what I did the day before. Usually, by the way, those are the days where you know, I finish at night and it's like, oh man, I was smoking today. Oh. And I open it up the next day like, oh my God, what was I smoking yesterday? You know, it's gotta like, so, so you never know how it will look back or sometimes something will become clear that you didn't know and so then you have to go back and say, oh, this is what I was actually doing. Um, but so I rewrite my way to open page and there are different people. Like Hemingway said, stop when you know what's gonna happen next. You know, like everyone has their different way of doing it. Um, but for me, it's like start with where I was yesterday or a little bit before that. Because, you know, when you're reading and you get to a blank space, you know, between paragraphs, it's like a place to stop. Or you get a chapter, it's a place to stop. But, you know, that's not how you write it. You write it and it's like, I'm out of time and I'm in the middle of a sentence. Got to go. You know, no, it's got a lacrosse game. Gone. Save the file. I'm gone. Right? And so um, sometimes it's messy. Um, the, uh, a, lot, a lot of the time... Didn't do it so much of this book, but in the past, um, after I, the first thing I do after I finish writing is exercise because I've been sitting for a long time. And I will go for a run or something like that. And while I'm running, stuff will become clear to me. 
and I'll, that I've been writing on it, it'll, like it'll figure itself out somehow. And, um, and so much so that I usually, I will come directly back to my desk and write immediately like notes, feverish notes to, to fix it later. And I've done that so many times that actually the finish on my desk right at the front there is ruined <laughs> from me sweating on it because I came back and like had to get out what became clear. Um, yeah, Yana? What about uh, that we're talking about movie and movie script to the curiosity? Oh, the ever? curiosity movie story. Yes. Um, okay, does anyone here know someone named Michael Petroni? Okay, cause, because I'm about to defame him. <laughs> it's just good to know in advance. So, so there's a guy named Michael Petroni who's a screenwriter, and, um, and he's made, his expertise is adapting um, books to film. And he's had 22 movies made. You've seen him, Master and Commander and The Book Thief and Chronicles of Narnia. You've seen this guy. And so they uh, hired 20th Century Fox, who had bought the rights to my film, hired Michael Petroni to write a screenplay adaptation of The Curiosity. And um, he was paid for that five times what I was paid for the rights. So that's how Hollywood works. I'm just the dumb guy who had the idea and uh, who made it all up. And, and um, he was four months late. And the screenplay was so spectacularly bad that there was a point in which um, my literary agent, my film agent, the executive producer, and I were reading passages to each other aloud in a conference call and laughing so hard that no sound was coming out. <laughs> This is true. If you, it, people who have read The Curiosity, you know that the way that Jeremiah gets out of his place with the keypad is that he convinces people that he's trustworthy, okay? No, in the screenplay, he punches a guard, and that's how he gets out. Um, when, when he's wandering the streets of Boston, he steals a car, and there's a chase scene. <laughs> Like, it was just really, really, really painfully bad. So, um, so we are not going to be doing Michael Petroni's script. And um, there, there are... <laughs> I know, I know. A different story. So, so um, it is still alive, and there are actually people looking at it, but we're a little bit treading softly right now because there's some interest in The Hummingbird. So we're going to see how that settles down and then, um, and then go back out. Um, but there's, there, are, there are folks that are interested in it. I got to tell you, I mean, I del I'm delighted that they like it, and you know, they pay me for the rights. That's really great. But um, you know, how many times can you say the movie was better than the book? You know, and so even if through some stroke of lightning, you know, they actually made this thing, um, my expectation is that he would punch his way out, and that he would steal a car and race away. And and you know, and certainly the fact that Kate and Jeremiah never had sex would just not happen in a film, right? That'd be like the opening sequence, you know, while the credits are going on. You'll figure out the story later, but um, so um, so uh, so here's what I'd like to do. Um, first of all, I want to thank you all for coming. Second of all, I want to thank um, the Phoenix for hosting this event. Um, you know, I, th this is a very strange entity, an independent bookstore, right? It's um, it's uh, it's a survival. Thing and it's for Burlington didn't have one, didn't have a bookstore for a bunch of years. It was selling new books, right? So it's fantastic that they did that things worked out here, and that now they're building an empire, and soon we'll all be groveling at the feet of them, just like we are with Jeff Bezos at Amazon, right? Uh, no, I don't think so. Um, but I'm doing I'm doing 27 stops on this tour, and one is a Barnes and Noble, and all the others are either libraries or independent bookstores. Yeah, which is great because the <laughs> keep it, Keeping the art form alive, you know, it's pretty great. Um, so, uh, as as um, I think Todd may have explained, um, I you know, I'd be happy to sign books for you, but I would really love it if you would sign my book for me, and you can write anything you want about anything you want. And I got four colors of ink, so you can really you know scribble out the work of the person before you, you know, feel like whatever whatever. And I and I had Renee write the first thing in it, just so that then you know nobody feels like they're really. And I'm so committed to this that when I spoke two days ago, three days ago at the Atlanta Book Festival, I forgot. So you guys are really the first ones with this. Um, to wrap up this part of it, um, gratitude to every one of you for being here. Um, and I'm going to read one more little section. Um, because, you know, because this is about hospice and a guy home from war, you may think it's really, really heavy. And, um, and it is and isn't. Like, the professor's kind of funny. So, um, so this is about... Um, this is Deborah talking about uh, one of her patient's situations. Um, uh, remember I said that, that Barclay had fired everybody? The person he fired before her was a, a woman named Sarah Schilling. 
Um, years back, I spent six months on central staff trying to win a promotion to management by handling the necessary but dull work of resource planning. Every day of it, I missed the patients and families, their pains and predicaments. Finally, I quit seeking advancement and went back to doing what I loved. But in those office-bound days, Sarah came in each morning humming a little tune. She'd switch on her computer, and while it booted up, she would turn to me, even if it was the 10th consecutive day of funereally depressing Oregon downpours, clasp her hands together and declare, what a beautiful day to be alive. Sarah had a pink cover for her cell phone. She decorated her cubicle with posters of cats hanging from tree limbs. At home, the woman had six pet birds, named after each of the seven dwarves except Grumpy. Of course, where there will be clients who find this sort of personality cloying. Where it matters, though, in caregiving situations, Sarah was more patient and comforting than I could ever hope to be. Once, once I was called in to help with a difficult case. Alan, who had tumors the length of his spine. As they grew, they were cracking his vertebrae. Suffering on that order, I would not wish on an enemy. Managing Alan's pain was challenging for Sarah, which is why Central Office asked me to assist. I guess that's my strong suit, reducing pain, I mean, which reveals more about me than I might immediately care to admit. No surprise, Alan's decline was driving his family into conflict. They were all loud, big people. The woman, women bosomy and round-faced, the men bearded and grim. They shouted for conversation, let their cell phones ring and ring before answering, left the TV turned up too high. But of course, the hearts of people like this break just like anyone else's. Their father was nearing his final hour as we were titrating morphine to see if we could mute the pain without making him unconscious. Meanwhile, we could hear everyone bickering in the living room at full volume. Someone in the kitchen slammed a drawer and I saw Alan wince. I'm tempted to go out there and slap some sense into someone, I muttered. Whatever my skills, I was still plenty capable of running out of patience. Sarah smiled at me, her freckled face drawn in at the cheeks. I know you don't mean that, she said, but I can see how you would feel frustrated. Ah, the forbearance of a hospice worker, wonderful and annoying. Sarah went to the doorway, hands clasped, just like at her desk in the morning, and cooed, excuse me, excuse me, everyone. It was like a dove flying into a den of bears. I was ready to see the feathers fly. But she spoke so softly, everyone just had to hush to hear. I'd like to invite you all in now. He's ready for visitors. I invite you to honor your father by joining hands around his bed. Perhaps there is a song he likes that you all might gently sing. I could never get away with being so directive. In a crowd like that, I doubt I could even get everyone's attention. But with Sarah, it worked. They rose as one and moved in her direction. Temporarily, at, e at least, she had ushered them from one stage of grief into the next. Not easy. By the time I'd packed my gear, they were sardined into Alan's bedroom, holding hands or draping meaty arms over each other's brawny shoulders and singing, You Are My Sunshine, in surprisingly good voices to a man so riddled with illness, the song probably felt like heaven already. Thank you.